This week's video is gonna be about why the drugs don't work, and by drugs, I'm gonna be focused on medication, mainly medication for depression, so antidepressants, and various other things, and why they don't work. It's quite a controversial subject, and again, people can find all sorts out there of information. So, it's not quite as cut and dry as one might think. But before we get to that, I'm gonna ask you please, can you like and subscribe to the channel? It really does help the channel and please feel welcome to leave any comments in the comments section below. Right, let's get on. Why don't the drugs work or do they work? Well, this is a big question. Let's start off with, I'm not gonna go into the history of antidepressants and I don't particularly want to go down the road of uh, conspiracy theories or anything within this either, but I wanna look at some uh, facts and the first one is, yes, your brain does release a chemical cocktail of serotonin, dopamine, endorphins, etc., etc., And uh, it's mixed with an ele electrical pulse and from cell to cell. So a neurotransmitter to a neuroreceiver and this excites the cells. That's what happens. Um, and that's pretty much backed up by science. Now the idea is that if you are suffering with depression or anxiety that this chemical mix is, uh, we need to adjust this chemical mix so your serotonin levels need to come up and whilst in and of itself it's a pretty good theory, um, it is just that. So the idea of antidepressants is that it's a reuptake inhibitor. What does that mean? Well the what happens is anything left over in that chemical mix gets taken back up by the brain and recycled, ready for another injection of uh, that chemical mix. So it gets reused. So the idea of antidepressants is, is that they hinder that reuptake process. So the chemical mix stays in between the two cells for longer, therefore exciting the receiving cell for longer, therefore improving mood. It's a pretty good theory and it's probably very, very close to the truth, in all honesty. However, it is just a theory. And where the medication tends to fall down is in several areas. First of all, when you go to see your doctor, your doctor has no way, absolutely no way of, it's impossible, of measuring your serotonin levels within your brain. It's beyond our technology. So they have no way of measuring your serotonin at, uh, when you go in uh, depressed or with anxiety or whatever it may be. And they now have, have no way of measuring the process during taking the medication or what's happening within your brain afterwards. It's impossible. Like I said, the technology isn't there. So this is where it really begins to be based on hypothesis and theory. And it's probably a pretty good guess in all fairness. I'm not here to bash the medical model. That's not what I want to do. But it does lead to some very, very big questions, which is, does it work? Why do I keep changing tablets? Why do uh, the doses keep going up. Well, there's several reasons for this. First of all, as I've explained, there's no way of actually measuring it. So it is a little bit of trial and error and guesswork to see what happens. Now, what do these tablets do? And I'm mainly pointing out SSRIs, but there are other medications out there. Some of them are extremely effective. Painkillers are extremely effective. You know, there, there are, there's a lot of medication out there which is extremely effective. That's not what I'm trying to knock. But when it comes to the case of taking these uh, antidepressants, amongst other uh, cocktails of uh, medication, they're often misprescribed and there is no way of measuring it, as I've said. So it becomes trial and error. Now, tablets on their own, medication on its own, can be enough to take the edge off of life. So it can be enough to take you from you know, the very bottomless pits of despair, just up enough to kind of get out of bed, get washed and maybe function. Okay, but it's not, in my opinion, it's not a cure. And the same happens with, you know, if you are experiencing um, a lot of uh, emotional 
emotional distress, they can be enough to just take the edge off that to give you a little bit of rest or they can completely knock you out to give you some rest. And that in a temporary, uh, for a temporary period of time is not necessarily a bad thing. It's probably a little bit better than self-medicating or I guess that statement's kind of quite arguable. It depends how you self-medicate, but Studies have shown, research has shown that when you mix medication along with some kind of therapeutic intervention, then the chances of relapse um, and the chances of actually making progress and actually getting to the cause of the symptoms, because the symptom is depression, the symptom is anxiety or whatever else you may be experiencing, then that getting to the root cause of it is and, and actually working with that and actually successfully kind of healing that, uh, the, the chances of doing that are greatly improved. You could say, in fairness, it calms you down enough or brings you up to a certain level in order to be able to work with yourself as well. So it gets you kind of functioning, stops, you know, puts, put, takes the edge off the anxiety attacks and the panic attacks, takes the edge off the depression, gives you a little bit of energy and you are able to do some work at your, on yourself with a therapist of some sort. Doesn't it have to be a psychologist? Doesn't it have to be a psychotherapist? I mean, there's there's a range of stuff out there. The, the, the big thing at the moment is, is the breathing techniques and the vagus nerve, and I'll probably do another video on that. These things actually work in terms of regulating the nervous system. Yes, you can explore your past. Yes, you can explore how the past is affecting you now, and you can design a new forward for you as well. These are all wonderfully helpful things. But if you want to avoid medication or get, get away from medication quite swiftly, there are other interventions such as the Wim Hof method, um, breathing methods, yoga, Pilates, meditation. If you start combining these things along again with, this, with talking therapies and interventions, you will begin to tackle and address the cause of the symptoms. So why am I saying all this? Where's this going? Well, I have a lot of people come into the therapy room who have, who report that they have been on the uh, medication, whatever medication for a long time. And they still feel at the same place that they were when they first started taking it. Often people report that they feel numbed. Um, they feel like zombies. They don't feel it's doing them any particular good and they're just kind of functioning other people, and so the, the, the progression with, these, with this medication is starkly slow. You could go deeper into the subject and you could look at certain companies, I won't name them on here, but where they are in court over the repackaging of certain medications to be used for something else. Now in and of itself, there's probably nothing particularly wrong with that but then certain medications causing, um, for instance, higher suicide rates or higher suicide ideation, more depression, um, more anxiety. So these, this medication can be quite detrimental to people as well. It can have the opposite effect. So what do we do about this? There's a book called Psychiatry Cracked, which was written by a psychiatrist whose name escapes me. And there's been a few books like that. Because what happens with some of the medical model, not so much in Europe, certainly within psych psychiatric and psychological circles, is the use of the DSM, which is the Diagnostic and Statistics Manual, which basically pigeonholes certain um, behaviours certain ways of thinking so for instance you know that's where all the personality disorders if you are are listed and there are criteria that you have to fit in order to fit that personality disorder and then you have your label and i'll do another video on labels because i'm not a big fan of labels they can be quite dis they can be quite depowering and people can use them actually as a defense well i'm this so therefore i'm going to continue doing this because there's no way out there's a big, uh, you know, I mean, for example, a big one out there is ADHD, which is known for being overly uh, prescribed and then medication given to children, such as Prozac and things like that, which is, causes a massive controversy and a big stir and a huge lot of problems. So this is where the medical model is working from. Yes, there are other things in there where it comes to, I mean, again, not so much in Europe, but more in America, 
where it's based on you know finances and your insurance so it's a big money game it was Gabor Mate who mentioned about alcoholism and the the creation of alcoholism as a disease became uh, came from it being put into the DSM because it needed to be prescribed in order for it to be treated under insurance in America it needed to come under as a disease and this was how that began I am off on a bit of a tangent as always but it's an explanation it helps illustrate how the DSM and the medical model can kind of work in adverse ways so again caution uh, is to be advised here when dealing with this now another problem I've come across a lot within medical institutions such as like kind of uh, more so in Europe and the UK um, and I'm not going to get into NHS bashing, bashing or anything like that but within the kind of public system where you are people with you know some more kind of on the severe side of certain um, things such as trauma response and, and depression and anxiety and things like that are met with a block a brick wall of well either being prescribed the wrong medication which has happened quite a lot or the wrong cocktail of medication so well you've got this and i think you've got that and i've got you've got this so i'll give you these three sets of tablets and actually they turn into a massive uh, detrimental cocktail because often doctors are uh, GPs are general practitioners they are not specialists they are a coverall and that's no disrespect to doctors at all it takes a long time to be a GP a lot of experience etc etc but they have limited ways in which to work with to cover everything they have a limited they have limited resources they are bound by the institution's uh, rules and regulations you have to bear that in mind and sometimes if you if you are suffering more severely then the only option is to privately go to pay and go to see specialists in that field and often they will say yeah uh, often the results are quite positive you know yeah it's the wrong medication it's too much of this not enough of that um, and they will often rec recommend a therapeutic intervention so these things are all to be considered. Now, not everybody has access to those kind of resources to access uh, private um, specialist help. So what can you do? Well, if you were to take a union stance on it, it's quite a popular stance. It moves out to everywhere else. Depression can be considered a gift and a call, as can anxiety. It's your body's way of telling you something's wrong. Okay, it's when... All the things you've been doing in your life have led to this point. And now, I mean, real depression is is like complete de-energization, right? You would then actually get a depressed, a real depressed patient within a therapy room. It's not gonna ha happen. They're liable to not even get out of bed. Okay, so there are, there's a gradient for depression. There's a gradient for anxiety. It's often been called as a gift and a call. It's it's a need for change. So everything you've been doing is now no longer working. It's actually working get against you. And your body is telling you something. And your body often knows more than you do because it doesn't act on conscious, particularly conscious awareness. It reacts more on an unconscious level. It feels things more than you do. Um, we tend to add thoughts to it and then that gets all distorted and there are justifications and rationalizations and defenses and denial and all sorts of stuff begins to kick in the the kind of advice there is to is to actually what the medication does is if you imagine depression as a, a a kind of black hole that you would have to descend into in order to change the only thing is you don't know how you're going to come out the other side so what the tablets do is they keep you going around on the event horizon of the uh, of the depression or of the anxiety so they hold you in that space okay rather than allowing for um, and an, annihil an annihilation of self, an annihilation of the old self, discard all of that and make some changes, some positive changes, which is where the therapeutic route goes, which is where the like breathing techniques, meditation, yoga, Wim Hof method and, and countless others, that's where they go. It's about teaching the nervous system new ways. It's about getting the nervous system to relax. It's about learning to self-regulate. It's about learning to self soothe it's about learning that you're no longer there you're actually here and actually learning ways to manage yourself and this crosses over into all sorts of 
things such as anger management and all sorts of stuff. Uh, to recap, so often the, the medication keeps us going around in that and that's why people, and then of course it starts to get worse and so the medication, the, the prescription amount goes up um, or the tablets get changed because it's not working. It's not working because you're just relying on that. And it's the same if you self-medicate, you'll increase your self-medication, you'll keep increasing it. So, to conclude, they can be quite medication i'm not dismissing it completely it can be quite healthy it's based on it's its mechanics are based on theory unfortunately um the brain is still something we are um amazingly um naive about and we are learning very very fast and the field of uh, neurobiology and neuroscience is is makes huge waves but it's always discovering new stuff equally if you find that the tablets are, are doing something then, then great. You know, don't, I'm not, I'm not encouraging you to stop them, but I, I would encourage that a combination of the tablets with some kind of therapeutic intervention to then remove the tablets eventually, continue with the therapeutic intervention, and then remove the therapeutic intervention because the idea is to learn to, is to reset your nervous system from your childhood trauma, your adult trauma, whatever it is that's triggered this all off, to practice new ways in self-regulation, practice new ways in self-soothing, uh, empowering yourself and moving forward, learning more about your body and how it reacts, learning more about yourself and how you react. Um, sometimes the why is not necessary to know, it's just acknowledging that you do and that it's not helpful and so you need to change that and do something else. It can be a really, really scary process, it can be really frightening and it can, but it can bring wonderful results and a whole new life for you so i hope that helps and as always please like and subscribe leave any comments you feel you would like to make in the comments section below and please take very good care of yourselves until i see you next time adios